<coughs> Thank you for that, Richard, and welcome, as Richard said, to you all. Um, so the web, which is a very reliable source of information, says that the three scariest things you can tell your mum about your career are, and I quote the following, Mum, I want to be a comedian. Followed by number two, Mum, I want to be a thespian actor. Followed by three, Mum, I want to launch a fruit smoothie company. <laughs> but with over two million innocent drinks being sold per week across 10,000 retail distribution outlets, this time Mum would have had nothing to worry about. Richard, John, and your good friend Adam, uh, all Cambridge University mates set up Innocent. They've created one of the most loved brands here in the UK. They grew the company from zero to 100 million in 10 years. If this, any of this is wrong, please do just <laughs> shout. Um, and they have, whilst doing this, they have made us all just that little bit healthier. So we are absolutely delighted to have Richard Reed here today. Richard, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Richard, if I can just start uh, by what I call the quick fire round, which is just a sort of a warm up uh, exercise, if you like, just to get to know you perhaps a little <laughs> bit better. Yeah. Um, was there any other name for Innocent that uh, you, are, you almost went with that you're pleased you didn't go with? Uh, oh, we, thousands. We, we burnt through so many different names. Our first one was Fast Tractor, which was all about our, the farmers were going to drive the tractors really fast from the field to the plant so the fruit would be really fresh. Then it was Hungry Aphid. For a while, someone was trying to persuade me we should call it monkey vomit, <laughs> which I just cannot see going down particularly well at Sainsbury's. And for a while, we weren't going to have a name. It was this sort of really sort of crazy thought that we wouldn't even have a name at all for the company, which was a dreadful idea. Um, <laughs> then we realised we wanted a name that suggested things were pure and natural and fresh. And so we chose the word naked. And we were really ch chuffed with that. And we agreed naked. And then just we were on the cusp three weeks before launching, someone said, said, you have trademarked that, haven't you? And I said, what's a trademark? Because <laughs> I had no idea, because we'd never set up a business before. And then explained what it was, went and looked out and realised that had already gone. So it was actually a real last minute thing that I only got to the word innocent by spending an afternoon in, in the reference library of Huddersfield Town, uh, which is the place <laughs> where I come from, with a big thesaurus looking up the word naked and natural and fresh, and then eventually got to innocent. Were you going to ever have CD or is that just a... Oh, CD was one on the list, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. In fact, CD, CD came above innocent in our sort of, on our final shortlist. We thought innocent sounded too... It said... I was looking back at our notes, it said it was too aromatherapy. We thought it was a little bit sissy, but um, we went for it in the end. Is there any vegetables or fruit you absolutely love or hate? Uh, I, I'm sort of weirdly obsessed with all of them. I absolutely <laughs> love them all. Uh, my favourite thing in the world is broccoli. Uh, it just shows you how tragic I am. I'm kind of the guy at the party that sort of, most people are sort of staring at the girls. I'm kind of just looking at the fruit salad in the corner. I'm sort of pretty <laughs> obsessed with it all. One of our viewers on BBO.com wrote in, and I think I know the answer to this one, and said, do you still live in shared accommodation with your university mates, John and Adam? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it feels like it. I mean, we do during the day. Uh, no, we have eventually, uh, eventually moved out and got our own places. I thought that would be the case. Uh, what's your number one passion outside of making us all a little bit healthier and innocent? Oh, blimey. Uh, I'm, I'm, a sort of, I'm a bit of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I split halfway between. I've got a hedonistic side and a very sort of natural side. So it's a combination between uh, nightclubbing in Ibiza and okay. um, meditating and hiking. Okay, so note to itself, don't go down the hedonistic route with you right now. Well, um, it'll be th fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you were on The Apprentice, do you think you'd win it? Oh, God, no. No, no, disaster. <laughs> I'd love to be like Margaret, though. Or I'd be, be great being that person. Wouldn't I mean, yeah, just sort of spying and reporting back. But being very mean. No, I'm not very good in those sort of things. I'm not particularly competitive. I don't sort of... Um, I'd be oh, too really? busy trying to get people to like me and make friends than to actually sort of win at anything, I think. <laughs> Uh, and final question, do you, uh, it's not a trick question, but do you like the taste of Coke? Uh, I, uh, I drink probably as many Diet Cokes as I drink smoothies. <laughs> so yeah, I have to say I love them both. I, I, don't, ch I don't touch red Coca-Cola, but um, Diet Coke, I'm a bit of an addict. Good. Thank you for that. So we all, that was the end of the interview. Any questions? No, I'm just... <laughs> um, Richard, it's quite humbling to know, actually, that you didn't leave school at the age of three to set up Innocent. You actually, like most of us here, had some pretty uh, unglamorous jobs compared with the one you've got at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so could you just tell us about, I think you had an epiphany once when you were on a factory floor. Could you share that with us? 
Oh, well, that, that was the point when I decided to become an entrepreneur. That's right. Which was quite sort of, um, I was 16 and my, um, I lived in Huddersfield and my job was, I worked for the local dog biscuit factory and the job was, I was literally assigned the task, I had to get down on my hands and knees and pick up the dog biscuits that had fallen off of the conveyor belt and put them into the bin. It paid two pounds an hour. And I remember the time being on my hands and knees picking up dog biscuits, thinking to myself, this is really not a great job. Um, <laughs> But I'm quite a geeky guy as well, so I wanted to do it properly, I wanted to do it well. So I went up to the foreman and said, do you have a, you know, I could do this better if I, if I, if, if I had a broom. Do you have a broom, a broom I could borrow? And he looked me dead in the eyes and just said, son, you are the broom. And that was the <laughs> bit where I thought, I'm getting out of this dog biscuit factory, I'm going to... And then I set up a little gardening business that afternoon, which was... Yeah, a bit better than dog biscuits. But that's quite a change point in your career, because imagine if you said, I'm the broom, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> You'd have had a totally different career path. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. But uh, you came up with the idea um, during a snowboarding weekend, or, or you came up with several ideas. What was one of, uh, um, with Adam and John, what was one or two of the ideas that you ple that you came up with you're pleased you didn't actually go with? Uh, yeah, because we actually, our whole thing was we, the, the business is born out of friendship, so it's myself and my two closest friends wanting to set up a business together. So it started from that. So it wasn't we didn't meet over mutual love of, of fruit juice. It was about wanting to do things together. Then to come up with ideas, we actually had a sort of a sort of pious moment, as I, you know, I think we all are when we're students. We said we want to do something noble and that will make life easier and better for people, and that was our starting point. And that led to what. I can, I can hand and heart say I think is the worst business idea in the history of several business ideas. It was this thing called the amazing electric bath, which was going to be a bath that would fill itself to pre-designated level and pre-designated temperature, all at the touch of a magic button. And we, myself and Adam went snowboarding in the afternoon, left John, who was the engineer, to start working out how it would work. And he actually started sketching out drawings. And I remember sitting in a bar in Davos in Switzerland, the ski resort we're at, looking at these drawings and pointing out that all of them had water and electricity in close proximity. And <laughs> we're supposed to be making life easier and better for people. We, we meant we're just gonna be making life a lot shorter for people. So <laughs> we said, this is a really lame idea. And so we binned that one. And actually, smoothies was the third idea. We, the second idea was we we're going to rid the world of door keys. That was our next big, big thought. Um, terrible <laughs> idea. Then smoothies just came from, we, we understood it. We wanted them ourselves. We were 26. We were, drinking too much beer, eating too much pizza. It was kind of to solve the riddle of modern life that people want to be healthy, but it's difficult to be so. So yeah. we wanted to make it easy. Yeah, because you hadn't, uh, you say in your book, uh, which is a great book to read, by the way, An story, Innocent Story, innocent story um, that there's always an opportunity if there's an unmet customer need. So at 26 years old, running around London, what was the unmet customer need you were solving then? Well, it was that. It was us getting up in the morning, feeling pretty lousy from the night before and wanting to, 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 to solve that. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how you, you guys find it. I, I find that there's, there's, the, there's the good voice inside my head that wants me to lead a healthier life, and then there's the sort of things that get in the way of it, and that could be anything from working late and not making it to the gym, and mm. or the, you know, there's some slightly more exciting things that get in the way between you and your sort of healthier self. And we, I guess we've always aspired to be people's healthy habit. We've all got lots right. of bad ones, but we wanted to make it easy for people to have a good one. So it's, I suppose it's about uh, being... Uh, better, not necessarily different. I mean, you didn't invent the smoothie. No, definitely not. In fact, there was already a smoothie been on the market for four years. Um, I, and I love people who come up with something absolutely brand new and, and, and original. And I yeah. can't claim that we did that. We, we, we saw a need and we thought we could come up with a way that would solve that need better. So a, a smoothie did exist, but it was a really mass sort of manufactured, heavily processed thing. And we said, no, we're just we're all innocent, we're just going to keep it really simple, going to do it naturally from fruit the way you'd want it to be made if you were making it yourself. And yeah. having that simple, easy to understand point of difference about being more natural, which delivers then better taste and better health, which are the reasons why people buy smoothies, that helped us sort of have a, a sort of a role to play on shelf. So as a sort of a brand value, you mentioned the word natural there, do you think natural encompasses more than better any other word, the innocent values? Yeah, I'm sort of a bit of a stuck record. I would say that if I mean, I, if you give me an hour, I can talk about innocent. Give me one word, I'd say natural. Right. About okay. natural products, natural ingredients, talking naturally, acting naturally, trying yeah. to get people that work at Fruit Towers to be their natural, the best version of their natural selves. It's, yeah. It is a word that we use an awful lot, both in its literal connotations, but also in a sort of slightly more values-based sense. Yeah, because I watched an interview, I think it was with you or, or, or John, where you were saying, you know, coming up with these quirky little labels and stuff, it's just as you would talk to 
the co-founders. You talk in a very natural way, and that's the way we talk to our consumers. So yes, it was never it was never orchestrated. It was never designed. It was just it reflects our own dumb sense yeah. of humour and the way that we talk to each other. And we just thought, well, we'd rather be ourselves than to be something that we're not. Yeah. And yeah. I think one of the things that has had an invisible but very real uh, value to the, to the business and the brand is that I. Uh, on, on our good days, we're fully congruent with ourselves. So what we think and what we feel is the same as what we say, it's the same as what we do, it's the same as what we make. And there's just something about, I think, in some sort of subconscious, invisible way that leads to a greater trust and authenticity Absolutely. and integrity, which is powerful in, in any for any brand, in any industry, but especially in food, where people kind of need to know that they trust the people that are making it because you're about to put it in your body. So yeah. it's is pretty fundamental. Just going back to the story then, so then you had the idea, you were 26 years old, running around uh, uh, town, unmet customer need, uh, you solved it, but then you did something that a lot, a lot of people don't do, and that is you actually took action on it. And uh, we've got a, a, a quote uh, by Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari, who says, the uh, true entrepreneur is a doer, not a dreamer. The critical ingredient is getting off your butt and doing something. <laughs> Um, and you took the first step, you actually took some money out, you, you made some smoothies and you went to go and de sell them down the marketplace. I know that you've been asked to tell this story more times than you probably sold innocent drinks, but if you could just tell us one more about what happened when you went down to the market. Well again, it was just, I guess we approached things very simply and with, with no cash, but we did a, the problem we were trying to solve was, is anyone going to like these smoothies and are they going to pay the money that we need to sell them at? And because up at that point, we'd made them in our kitchens and tried them out on our mums. And if your own mum doesn't think your products are good, then you know you're in trouble. <laughs> so we needed some people that didn't know us. And did mum like them, by the way? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Good. Yeah, well, yeah, no, she did. She's, well, she'd, you know, she'd sort of be critical as well about how to make them better, but um, well, she'd she be very supportive. Um, it, we just had this great opportunity. It was coming up to the summer, um, and there was a local music festival near where we lived in West London. And we recognised that the people going to that festival are exactly the people that we would aspire to buy our drinks and we thought we would just see if they liked them. So we bought 500 pounds worth of fruit, turned it into our favourite recipe at the time, made a thousand bottles of smoothies and then sold them from a stall. And the stall was literally just some bales of hay and some planks of wood, some big things full of ice to keep the drinks cold. And to get the, I guess in a very simplistic way of doing market research, we just put up a big sign above the stall that said, should we give up our jobs to make these smoothies? And they had a bin that said yes on the front of it and a bin that said no on the front of it and got people to buy the smoothies drink and vote the empty bottles. And as a group of three friends, because we've been working with the idea for six months but still in our day jobs, as a group of three friends, we had all looked each other in the eye and said, if the yes bin is full at the end of that weekend, we will go in the next day and resign. So we had this sort of quite hot, sweaty Sunday evening when we realised <laughs> the yes bin was full. And they had, in fact, the only bottles of the no bin were actually from our parents who were trying to <laughs> persuade us out of giving up our decent jobs at the time. And <laughs> but then we had this, so we all committed to each other that at 10.30 the following morning, we'd all resigned from our, our jobs. And I remember still outside my, op, my boss's office at 10.27 thinking, I'm not going to do this because I'm just not convinced that they're going to do this. And so I went back and remember ringing about 10.33, ringing Adam and John going, have you resigned yet? And they're like, no, <laughs> have you resigned yet? And I'm like, no, I haven't either. And none of us wanted to go first because I think we all suspected that the other two might just be doing it to stitch their mates up. <laughs> <laughs> because you had some pretty decent jobs there. You were working for some pretty, uh, pretty good companies. Yeah, no, we were, we were very lucky and they were, yeah. they were brilliant about it. I worked in an ad agency, Adam worked at Virgin and, and um, John worked at Bain, the management consultancy. Yeah. And they, were, they were just absolutely awesome about it. I mean, we're so massively grateful. The whole, in, in every which way, the, the UK, everything from our friends and families through to our workplaces to the press to the sort of the the consumers, they've been really supportive of the business. Yeah. So um, my office actually, my place of work allowed us to work from there for two months for free and have Adam and John turn up and work from a little office there just to support us as we got going. Where was that? And it was an ad agency called BMP. Okay. Um, so you talk about the management team for a second then. You, a lot of people when they set up a, a sort of a, a startup team, they have to sort of go through all these process of looking at psychometric reports, make sure there's balancing on the spectrum, you've got strengths and weaknesses met and a complementary team. Was it just luck that you guys came together with a great, such a great complementary skill set or do you actually not have a complementary skill set, it just worked? Well certainly one of the top three things that's allowed the business to be successful is that, is that original team. We were extremely lucky that we are we were and are absolutely friends first and foremost, yeah. which brings a, a really high degree of trust. And I have to say, I've found trust to be the most efficient thing to have in, in business, you know, because it means you don't have to worry and chase things up and make sure that yeah. people are going to do it. So 
having that trust, but then between the three of us, having a very similar set of values about what's important, what we care about, and a, a similar sort of ambition of, of where we want to get to, and but yeah. the, how are we going to get to? You know, we want to be successful in a way that we can be proud of. So to have all that alignment, but then actually the three of us are very different in terms of what, we, what we're each in theory good at. Okay. Yeah. So I was always going to be the consumer facing guy. Adam was always the guy that was dealing with retailers and John was always the guy dealing with the operations. Yeah. And so, the, and it took five minutes to divide up who was going to do what, because it was just, it was obvious to each of us what we were each going to do. Yeah. And we always said, actually, if you put the three of us together, you get one good business person, because we sort of cover off between us the sort of the things that you need. So I'm always in absolute yeah. awe of <coughs> people that certain businesses by themselves, because you've got to do You've got to have such a, 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 such a strong left brain and such a strong right brain. You're dealing with everything from sort of financial accounting through to creative thinking via people management versus innovation and negotiation. It's, there's no way I would have or could have done it by myself, but as a team of three with shared values and complementary skills, it got us off to a great start. Let's talk about, if we can, uh, raising finance. So you were raising finance back in 1999, um, and with, you know, I think a lot of people think it was, must have been easy for you to raise finance. You had, you know, all Cambridge grads, great idea. But you were mm. raising finance in 1999, the peak of the dot-com boom, not the fruit smoothie boom. Yeah. Um, and you found it quite challenging. So what were some of the, um, uh, tell us some of the stories about that and maybe one or two of the lessons that you learned from raising finance back then. Well, but I have to say, I mean, I don't think we could have found it much harder because, I mean, everyone said no absolutely every type of avenue and every version of that avenue said no. So we applied to 20 different banks for the Small Business Loan Guarantee Scheme, which is the thing where the government acts as a guarantor of the loan, got turned down 20 times in a row. We applied to every venture capital fund in London that had anything to do with food and drink or anything to do to cover our sort of bite size. Uh, they were just, they were flat no's and they were really quite sort of quite pointed no's. I remember one guy saying you score zero out of five in the investor's handbook. You're, you're too young. You're all friends. You haven't appointed a clear leader because we said we'd do it as the three of us together. You, you've never set up a business before and you're going, up, you're going up against the world's biggest food and drinks companies. You said, it's a dreadful idea. I'm never going to invest. And we were then burnt through all this. There's lots of networks of private investors and we went to a thing. We had our, after 11 months of being turned down and being told no, with apps, it's not like a, a maybe. It was, it was flat no's right from the beginning. Yeah. Our very, very last opportunity was we'd given half an hour to pitch this room of 50 business angels to an organisation called Lento, which I think stands for London Enterprise Network Trust. And you get your half, it's like pre-dates Dragon Dem, it's a similar vibe. There's 50 multimillionaires in a room wanting to invest and you get your half an hour to go and pitch in. And we sat, we spent two days in Adam's bedroom rehearsing the pitch over and over again because we knew it was our absolute last shot at it. We went in, we sold our hearts out for half an hour and at the end we said, if anyone's interested in investing or hearing more, could you put your hand up? And it's quite a sobering experience to see 50 people not to put their hand up. <laughs> and you just have to pack your silly little bottles of smoothies in your bag and walk out again. And that was it. And we went home that evening and we sat in our, on our blue Ikea sofa in our flat in Barron's Court and said, well, that's it. We're done. Because there, there just wasn't anyone left to ask. And partly as a joke and partly out of desperation, that evening we sent out an email that just said in the subject line, does anyone know anyone rich? And I nicked a load of email addresses from my ad agency where I used to work, and we kind of spammed half of London. <laughs> and we got two responses back. One from uh, an ex-boss of mine who confessed to her having uh, an affair with this tax exile that lived in Monte Carlo. So she suggested we should send the business plan to him. Um, <laughs> and he said no, but at least we got to find out some really great gossip. And then, um, <laughs> then John had a friend who, had, as a student, had done a year's work experience in the office of a guy that sometimes made investments and introduced us to him. And we went in to see him, and he said he thought the idea sucked, but he believed in the three of us. And he would put in 50 grand and get 200 grand, because we were trying to raise 250, the other 200 grand from his other seven investors that he would always act as the lead investor for. And he said, for the last 20 years, when I put my money in, they always follow. We went back to see him three weeks later, and for the first time in... <laughs> Seven, 20 years, all seven of them said they turned him down. So then he was in this weird situation. We had, he had had to let us down or make good on the deal, and he put the full amount in himself. And he was telling this story about four years ago, uh, a thing he was talking about. Someone said, did you put in that money out of obligation or because you thought it was a good investment? And he said, entirely out of obligation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he did a good job. He, he's recently sold some of the uh, the equity in the business, hasn't he? So he's he, he just 
he loves it so much because he says it's his single, he's 75 years old, he says it's the single best investment he's made in a career is investing, and it's the one all his mates turned down, so he loves <laughs> taking the piss out of his mates for saying no. <laughs> Richard, so I imagine some of those some of those days were probably your darkest, particularly the smoothies in the bag walking away. So what, <laughs> what, what I can feel the pain. What was uh, it that made you have the conviction to plough on through those dark, dark days? Oh, well, I guess for me it was two things. One is um, the the fear I, I the fear of it not happening okay. was scarier than the fear of continuing. Yeah. I, I actually loved my time in advertising. It was really good. I really enjoyed it, but I was so scared of going back. Right. So I was prepared to keep going. I, it, it just, it, no matter how horrible, it was better than going back. But then also the other big thing is you're doing it in a team of three. So when I'm having a bad day, maybe Adam and John were having a better day and we could just G each other up. So again, yeah. no, I wouldn't have started by myself and I certainly wouldn't have got there by myself. It's, yeah. It was having the team that got us there. Got it. Um, if we can talk about uh, product development now, because you've got these innocent smoothies, but you've also got the inno innocent veg spots. I absolutely love innocent. I'm not just saying that because we've got you here, but I do have, you know, a smoothie in the morning, veg pot at lunch. That gives me my five a day, and then I feel that I can eat whatever I want. Dominoes, Dunkin' That's why you look so good. Well, you there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I'm probably missing the point because my evening goes off off on one. But what, in terms of product development, how do you actually, I mean, that was quite a big move from the smoothie to the vegetable pot, I'd imagine. So mm. how do you decide wh what products to go with and what's the modern day equivalent of a yes, no bin? Well, I guess we start with, uh, I know it sounds like quite sort of corporate language, but we always start with the mission of the business. And we, we, uh, we genuinely at the absolute heart of Innocent is a real uh, sincere motivation to get healthy products to people. That's really ultimately yeah. what we care about. We, we kind of want to be this Trojan horse in society getting these wonderful things called fruit and veg into people yeah. by making them really tasty and convenient and, and all that type of stuff. So for some people thought it was unusual for a smoothie business to bring out those veg pots, but for us it, was, it couldn't be more what we always set out to do. Mm. We also made a, a strategic decision about five years ago as a business, we're only ever gonna, because we're only ever gonna make healthy products, we're only ever gonna work with healthy ingredients. And the, the scientific advisory committee, which is an independent panel of nutritionists and doctors, every four years review the state of the nation's diet and the state of the nation's health and say what we should all be eating more of to basically live longer. And yeah. they identified five food groups, which was fruit, vegetables, whole grain, dairy, and oily fish. And we took a look, look at the list and said, we're not going to be the oily fish fruit juice company because <laughs> that ain't going to work. But those other four, they're our ingredients. That's all we'll work with. And we won't work, work, work with anything else. Mm -hmm. So when we approach new product development, it kind of starts with what can we now make that's going to help get people to have that inside their bodies so they get healthier. Got it. And we wanted to do for vegetables what we've done for fruit with smoothies and veg pots was our answer to that. Got it. So um, the passion about getting uh, more fruit and vegetable out there helps you. I mean, you talk about uh, keeping the main thing the main thing. Is mm. that what you mean, sort of, you know, making the world healthier? Is that's Yeah, I mean, the main I'm going to turn into a Miss World contestant <laughs> but in terms of how I talk, if, if I'm not okay. careful. But we, we really do care about making yeah. it easy for people to be healthy. Our little house phrase that we use is we want to help people live well yeah. and die old. Mm. That's because we want health and pleasure and all the vitality, but also to give at the final analysis, the body, the ability to fight disease, and you need the micronutrients that are in fruit and vegetables to do that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But if you come to Fruit Towers, which by the way, everyone's very welcome to, the door is literally always open. You'll see in the chill out area, which is the place where we hang out, there's a big TV screen in it, on, on it, and that has our fruit and vegetable portionometer, and it counts up in real time every second how many portions of fruit we're getting we're selling each day and how many portions of vegetables. Awesome. And we, of course, we measure the business in financial terms, yeah. absolutely, because it's a business, but we also absolutely measure it in the sort of the mission terms of are we achieving our aim of helping the nation get a little bit healthier? Because keeping that, having a crystal clear purpose like that and keeping the main thing the main thing, I'd imagine helps you on key strategic decisions as to which way to go. Like, for example, you were deciding whether to distribute via McDonald's, which obviously is quite a controversial thing because the brands don't exactly align. But I suppose. Uh, your decision to go with McDonald's as a distribution agent would have been to sell more fruit and vegetable. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I personally love the idea for that now in a kid's Happy Meal, for absolutely no money, you can have a smoothie, which is a portion of fruit, as opposed to a, a fizzy drink, which isn't. So for me, it's absol it couldn't be more what we're in, 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 the, in, in the business of, of wanting to do. But yes, it was the most controversial decision 
we've made in terms of what the press made of it. It was, it was amazing. I mean, for us, we were selling our smoothies, which is we're kind of a smoothie company, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna sell our smoothies. But um, if if we can. Um, talk about uh, beating the giants. You have been up against some of the greatest F&B companies in the world as a, as a startup company. So if we can have a one minute masterclass from Richard Reed on how a small company can beat corporate giants like you have done. Mm. Well, I'm old fashioned, so I think 95% of it is you've got to have a better product. And we genuinely did. I don't mean yeah. in a, sh a showy off way. I mean, just in terms of everyone else would use concentrates, we used fresh fruit, everyone would put in preservatives. We kept ours in the chiller. So fundamentally a product that was better in a way that was relevant to the consumer it wasn't better in our terms it was better in terms of it tasted better and it was healthier and yeah. that that's got that's the main consumer benefits of having a smoothie i think that we articulated ourselves in a way that was consistent and the brand was seen as being transparent and real and credible it looked nice on shelf so it had the greatest job of packaging is to make you want it before you even know what the thing is. And I think we got our packaging right, so that helped. Yeah. Um, and we just went at it a bit harder. Because when you think about it, you're not up against Coca-Cola or Pepsi, the business. You're up against, most of the time, a junior brand manager on 35 grand a year. And they'll be good and they'll be talented, but they're not gonna care quite as much as we do. So right. if you've got a better product with a better brand and you're prepared to just work it harder, then you can get your foot in the door. And when you get the foot in the door, it's like getting an interview. A better CV gets you the interview, but once you're there, it's up to you. And it's like getting that supermarket listing. It's much easier to get the supermarket listing if you're a big established brand. It was bloody difficult for us because we, we weren't known and we were seen as being a sort of a, a bit of a joke company that's going to go up in a ball of smoke. <laughs> but we finally, finally, finally got those first 10 listings in Waitrose. And then I guess we did something that a big corporate can't do is we were a little bit cheeky. We recognised that was our most important listing we're ever going to get. If it works in those 10, they're going to roll us out. If it doesn't, we're screwed. Mm. What did we do? We went in and we bought our own products because that was the <laughs> only way that we could guarantee to sell the products. And then from that 10, we got to 20. From that 20, we got to 40. And then the business started you know, really accelerating. Yeah. One of the things you're known for is obviously is the quirky brand, but you don't spend billions of pounds on a great, the world's greatest advertising agency to create that for you. You do that yourself and in terms of these, these labels and these, this quirkiness that you Well, create. yeah, for the first five years, we didn't have any advertising. Right. So it was all about through the packaging, through the yeah. events that we did, through sampling, through PR. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that was cost us nothing was create the most value is just writing dumb jokes and interesting copy on the side and keeping that constantly ticking over because it's, it's just, it, it just created a slightly more personal connection between the person that bought the product and, uh, and the brand and it just made it a little bit more interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's got us into trouble at times as well, you know, the, all these things, they have a cost and things that we weren't going to measure. There's sometimes we put jokes in the ingredients panel and I remember this one time where I'd written on a, on a strawberry banana smoothie, six strawberries, three bananas, half an orange and two plump nuns. It didn't really mean anything, it was just a stupid joke, I printed it, forgot about it. This was about three years into the business and then about uh, about three weeks later, I got a call from Kensington and Chelsea Trading Standards <laughs> saying, um, well, we've had this brought to attention. What are you doing? And I was on the phone explaining to them it's just our stupid sense of humour. We didn't mean anything bad by it. And they said, well, you can't do it. It's illegal. We're launching a formal inquiry. And they, I remember they thought you'd committed murder. <laughs> well, there was we to be fair, we had broken the law. You're not allowed right. to do that. And yeah. It, th this thing rumbled on for six months of us having to issue our defence and, you know, put in our counter arguments. And I had to have my, not a day in court, because it wasn't actually a legal thing, it was a training center thing. So it was like a proper adjudication where you have a, a person that weighs up the case. And the person that was in charge of it had heard my evidence and heard this, the, the, the prosecution and said, well, we're going to retire and write you with, with, our, with our, our decision. And I swear, it's my, I, think, I think actually it's my favourite moment of the last 12 years is opening this, this letter and it said, Dear Mr. Reed, you must either take off the reference to plump nuns or start putting them in your fruit juice. And it was, it was just quite an amazing moment to sort of have seen that's where the bureaucracy had got us. Talking about the, the culture that you've created, and it does say on your website that you can swing by fruit towers anytime you want. And so actually last week I did do that. Um, and I was walking down, I think it was Vine Street, and the first thing I saw uh, in the car park was obviously a cow parked in the car park. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a van. Cow van, yeah. Yeah, exactly, a cow van. And then I get closer to the door, and above the door it says people, and above the window on the next to it, it says burglars. So yeah. obviously by the time I got through the window, um, I saw this 
Uh, lovely lady with a massive smile on my face, expecting her to just rebuff me and say, oh, it's just our website thing. She was so genuinely lovely. And you know, she, she uh, got somebody to show me around. They had two people <laughs> fighting about who should show me around. Um, and I didn't want to leave. It was such a cool, creative place to, to, to be. And I you weren't expected, right? You just turned just up. Just turned up. Yeah. Just yeah. turned up. And it was incredible because I, um, I didn't want to leave. But I thought that you know, if I made a scene and didn't leave, then the chance of you turning up today would be a lot less. Um, but it really is. How do you create such an amazing culture like that where everybody is so genuinely energized at work? Well, look, we're massively lucky because you don't, you don't create a culture. It's, it's, it's the people that you recruit. So I think the, I, I, my personal belief is the single most important business decision one ever makes is who you get to come and join yeah. your business. Because everything, I mean, it's, this is obvious, everyone knows this. Everything a business does or doesn't do is the result of a human being doing it or not doing it, caring or not caring, it, having the skills or not. And we were clear what we wanted in terms of brand. We wanted it to be genuine, to be mm. friendly, not saccharine, not sort of, not falsely trying to be your mate, but just open and honest and up for it. And you can only be those things. It can only be genuinely that way if people are genuinely like that. So mm. we've just been very strong on recruiting firstly, not only, but firstly on the values of people we come to meet. And yeah. if they personally chime with the values of the business, then they're through to the next round. And if they don't, then they're not. And if I was to do it all again, which hopefully I will, I'm definitely keeping that as one of my main bits of philosophy of approach to business. You gotta have your values, what you care about, and then bring in people that care about those things too. Good, yeah, because otherwise, I mean, with all that fun around, I suppose, get making sure people are serious about hitting their targets. People work, I don't expect it to work incredibly yeah. hard, and we have a really, really tough uh, performance management process where twice a year everyone gets a rating of one through to five. Five is you're an absolute star, one is you're a doofus and you need to sort it out immediately. And every bit of pay, access to options, access to the, pop, the profit share scheme is directly linked to that. So we, and we, and everyone has five objectives which they're assessed against. So it, there's absolute transparency and clarity and real-time feedback about what's expected and how you're doing against what's expected. Yeah. Is that, are those five objectives, is that a quarterly thing, monthly thing, annual, or is it just... We review them. I mean, they're supposed to be always kept alive, yeah. but they're reviewed formally every six months, but then everyone has a one-to-one -one with their boss once a week, and the agenda is always, right, let's go through the five things, because it's the five things that you're contracting to deliver for the business over the next six months. And if you deliver all five, then you're into the high performance category and you get more pay. And yeah. it all sort of self-perpetuates. Obviously, we've talked a lot today about how the beautiful brand of Innocent, what a great job you guys have done in it. So um, how does that, how is that congruent or how does that fit in with a 58% sale of your company to Coca-Cola? It does, surprisingly so. And I guess Emerson okay. is surprising because I guess myself a few years ago wouldn't have thought that was going to quite be, you know, the the, the way that things were going to go. Yeah. And even when we started to fundraise, and this was all about raising cash in a tough climate to fund our international expansion, Coke were almost the opposite of where we thought we were going to end up. What happened was, from meeting them versus everyone else we met, they were absolutely straight out the gate, the most honest, the most decent, the most um, into the brand, not wanting to meddle people that we really thought we could work with. And I think they have done, I personally think it's a unique deal. Um, I, and maybe not, maybe it has been done somewhere some before, but I think it's very, very unusual in that they actually now own the majority of shares in the business, but the owning of shares have been fully separated from control rights of the business. So whilst they have the majority right. of the shares, they don't have control rights of the business. There are, there are four seats on the board, each with one vote. I have one, Adam has one, John has one, Coke has one. It has been deliberately de facto arranged that so we have majority control. Mm. And so they actually genuinely, in the hard legalities of it, can't stop us if we want to launch a new country, a new product, uh, a new ad campaign, change the nature of the business. It's, it's simply, it's our call, not theirs. And I think that's mm. a really big deal for a big multinational to, to make that level of investment and accept that, that lack of control. Yeah. But their whole thing was, you're different. It, Innocent does things differently to Coke. If we got involved, we would probably, <coughs> we might sort of fiddle with it and we don't even want to, we don't even want the, the ability to be able to do it. We want you guys to come and do what you're doing. We've got our own business that we're gonna run, but do let us know if we can help. And they're the okay. most awesome guys that we ring up. They never ring us, but we ring them when we need a bit of help and they will fall over themselves to help us. But right. our contractual obligation to them is to have four to our meetings a year, which is, 
not exactly heavy-handed. Do you have a fear, though, that because Innocent is such a sort of uh, independent, quirky brand, that now it's known in the marketplace that you're majority owned by Coca-Cola, people like Barry, who's a fan of yours, who's got a logo, Innocent logo on his arm, I'm, I'm sure you probably know him, tattooed, yeah, yeah, tattooed know him very on his well, arm. Yeah. Um, we've got five people who've got the logo tattooed. So oh, really? Yeah, we've got a corporate target to get to 10 by 2012. <laughs> so. If anyone can help us out with that, that would be great. Do you think that, that, that the raving fans are going to disappear now? It's, it feels like it's a, a brand of Coca-Cola? I think the people that were... Because most people don't care. No. But the, the people that, that did and do, in the main, <coughs> I think they thought, that's a bit weird. I'm mm. not sure I feel about that. I feel a bit queasy about that. And our view was, we get that, but hear us out. We're the same people making the same products in the same way. Everything that you know that we stand for, about giving 10% of profits to charity, investing in making food that's ethically sourced, yeah. doing stuff with this sort of slightly stupid sense of humour, everything that you've liked of Innocent, any promise we've ever made absolutely continues yeah. because we're the same people doing it in the same way. What, what our sugar daddies, what we call Coca-Cola, have done is given us some cash to be able to do more of what we've always set out to do. Um, and we said, give us just... Sit with it, see how it goes for you, and see if you can spot the difference. And yeah. there isn't one. We're better now. We're more innocent now than we ever have been. And yeah. we, I have to say, I genuinely believe we, we, we've kept people with us. We had a few people that were massively anti-Coca-Cola come mm. on our blog, but they weren't innocent consumers. They were just and they were and they anti were anti-Coke people. Right. Um, I guess the other funny thing is it's not it's not like Nestle, which has got a really bad reputation yeah. it, it, from the past, but it, it's there. Uh, Coke is, and remains so, the world's most popular consumer brand. So yeah. there's a lot more people that love it than don't. And you, you went uh, the trade exit as opposed to VC money because of the distribution network that Coca-Cola has, I assume, and the experience they I'd have. So if that had been the reason for the deal, then we'd be gutted because okay. they can't help one iota with the, the path okay. to market, because simply because well, first of all, we did the deal with the Coca-Cola company, which is the brand-owning bit of the business, yeah. not the sales and distribution bit of the business, which is Coca-Cola Enterprises. Even if we had, they don't run chilled vans, and our products are chilled. They said at the time, we can put you, we own a million fridges across Europe. We can get you into all of them, to which we think, awesome. And then about three months into the relationship, they come back to us and go, um, we've just found out that all our fridges turn themselves off at night automatically to save electricity. <laughs> so absolutely impossible for us to be in them. So they can't help with that. Okay. What they can help with is we, we now buy our plastic bottles cheaper. And we now buy our media cheaper because we've got the relationship with them. Okay. But in the main, it's just being able to, it's the cash yeah. and being able to tap them up for advice and to, to talk through problems with them because they've <laughs> just it. seen a lot of the things that Got it. We're addressing. Okay, so it's not you can get a cash from the VC, but it's the, it is the supply chain beneficiaries as well you can get along the route. I think it's the knowledge, I th but also you know what? It's it was also it was a very human decision. Yeah. The guys that we met the first time right. are the guys that we ha have the relationship with, and yeah. also weirdly in one of the terms, even if the guy that we did the deal with, if he gets promoted or moves on, yeah, that it our relationship remains with him. Yeah. Because it was a personal thing. We really trusted him. We really liked him. It was, it was super smart. Um, I, bet, I bet you didn't have a junior associate come up with these legals. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they were. They, it, it, weirdly, it, it's what they wanted. Yeah. It is absolutely what they wanted. They, um, um, they like what we do. I'm sure there may be some questions from the floor on that matter. But just uh, the last final thing before we go to the floor then, um, and that's a painting of the future. A lot of people uh, have said that there's quite a lot of similarities between Richard Reed and Richard Branson in the sense that you've both got the same first name. Uh, you, <laughs> came up with though, a, you came up with a brand, Virgin and Innocent, oh, yeah, or something yeah, similar yeah, there. Yeah. So is, where's the Innocent company going to go to? I mean, are we going to go, are we going to see Innocent Mobile, Innocent Galactic? What's next for uh, Innocent? <laughs> Well, I have to say, when we first pitched to Morris, the guy that originally stumped up the cash, we said Innocent is going to be this sort of natural, healthy, luxury brand. We're going to do body care, and we're going to do travel, and yeah. we're going to do gyms and spas and all that type of stuff. And he still takes the piss down and goes, so what happened to any of those things? What we have realised is there's such tremendous opportunity in the world of making natural, healthy food, yeah. ethical and available and tasty. And <coughs> we're going to do that for the next 30 years. Okay. After that, and then we'll do the hotels and the spas and yeah. stuff. But for the next 30, we got a vision to become the Earth's favourite little healthy food and drinks company. And yeah. that's what we think there's, there's a big, big benefit to focusing. And we've learned that the hard way because it's been the years when we stopped focusing and yeah. started chasing after new things that we nearly screwed up and 
nearly really properly hurt the business. Yeah. So we're we're back to being keep the main thing the main thing. Got it. Natural, healthy, ethical food. Richard, you're an entrepreneur. There's no question about it. You have done a phenomenal job. You've had a great idea. You've executed on the idea. You've got a management team around you. You've then exited 58% of the company to uh, a well-known company, made a lot of money in the pro process, and have done us all good in the process. So <laughs> that's all good. But surely now you've done that, and you alluded to it earlier, saying that you would take the hiring skills that you've learned onto your next company. Mm. Is there going to be a next company? What's next for Richard Reed? I'm more engaged now than I ever have been, and Innocent Remains are absolute full-time role. Yeah. There will be, at some point, there will be, we're just the first leaders of Innocent, and there will be future leaders of Innocent, and it's okay. not going to be for a few years yet, but yeah, yeah, there's going to be some time in my sort of, once I'm the other side of 40, okay. um, and I'm not the kind of guy that's going to just be able to his, hit the beach and <laughs> sit around. I, I, I get myself into sort of... Uh, no, I mean, the question I keep asking myself is, what do we want to change next? And it's a really nice question to ask myself. And yeah. But the reality is I can't go there yet. I've got to focus on Innocent. The yeah. bigger, the better years of Innocent are the, the next few than the previous few. So okay. it's that first, but post-Innocent, that will be definitely the next thing. What you're saying is... There's more opportunity where you want to take the company now. Yeah, yeah, we, we're okay. so not done with Innocent. It's absolutely, we're leading it. It's our full-time role. We do. Coco and his sleeping partner, uh, it's 100% led and run by the people at Innocent. So yeah. it's more smoothies, I'm afraid, for the time being. I very much enjoyed this interview. Thank you very much indeed. On behalf of all of us, Richard, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we've got some time. I think we've got um, microphones either side. Is that right? Any questions from the floor? Can I take you back to uh, the start and you were talking about unmet customer needs? Yeah. Um, Pete and Johnny's Smoothies was around, I think, before Innocent. For four years, yeah. Yeah. W when you looked at that, so there's clearly a company that's in, been in the market doing a reasonable amount of what you were trying to do. Yeah. What made you think, okay we can come in here and, and, and knock them out of the way. Yeah. Well, I guess we didn't see, we didn't think directly in relation to them. We thought smoothies is a great idea and great. There's only one other brand and it's a small independent. It's not like from the get go, we're going to get to the big guys. However, of course, we definitely saw we were going to need to articulate why innocent rather than PJs if you're only going to take one. Um, it comes back to the natural thing. PJs were made from concentrate. Which is, I'm not saying that's bad, it's just not the same as making it from, from, from fresh fruit. So we said, first of all, we can make the product taste better and have a better nutritional profile by making it more natural. Secondly, when I looked at the brand, I just didn't get it. I didn't get what Pete and Johnny's smoothies meant. And, there was, and it turns out there wasn't a Pete and there wasn't a Johnny. So it was kind of like a sort of inspired by Ben and Jerry's, but sort of... I mean, the weird thing is set by a company called... Uh, they set up by two guys called Pat and Harry. I don't know why they called them Pat and Harry's. <laughs> I would, have, I would have liked it more if it had been called Pat and Harry's. The other thing, it was, in, it, was, it, was just, it was in a cloudy bottle, and so you couldn't see the contents, because the contents were a little bit gloopy because they're made from concentrate, whereas ours was, we're going to put it in a clear bottle. And I know that sounds like so, such a small-scale answer, but in the world of F FMCG, so much of it is what's in your bottle, what does your bottle look like, where's your mm. bottle sold? And so a slightly better product, we thought a brand that was going to be slightly more truthful, um, and this, uh, I don't want to be negative about P and Johnny's because we owe them a lot. They created the category, and I think that was a good brand. And I'm, I'm sorry, it's no longer exists. It was bought out by Pepsi Cola, and Pepsi Cola ran it into the ground. Um, and I think Pat and Harry did a, you know, a, a great job with getting it started. Um, but yeah, we, we did see them, and we thought we can do something which is going to be feel slightly more in line with what consumers want of, of their food. Um, but it was more about trying to get a smoothie market going than to try and steal share from Pete and Johnny's. And for quite a long time, we both grew really well together. Over here. Yeah, just wanted to ask you about the sort of prosaic subject of VAT, because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, as far as I'm aware, generally, sort of, generally foodstuffs don't attract VAT, but I think smoothies do. Mm. Same, Tell Britain. me about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering whether, it, to what extent it kind of actually guides your choice for new products. So when I was thinking about the veg pot, I thought maybe that doesn't attract VAT because it's a veg pot, and whether that kind of makes you think, get more enthusiastic about it as a result, especially with VAT yeah. going up to 20%. And whether, you know, if you think, did you think about making your smoothies thicker so that they weren't, they got to a certain thickness that they were no longer a smoothie? And yeah. I mean, do you play around with these things? It must, you know, VAT at 20%, it's going to make a huge difference. And 
and also whether different countries, you know, we out of step, do you pay VAT on smoothies all over Europe? Don't get me started about VAT and smoothies, because I think it's so bonkers, because you say food doesn't have it on, so burgers, donuts, they're VAT free. A smoothie, which is two portions of fruit, is taxed. It's completely mad, especially when the government spends millions of pounds each year telling us to get your five a day, and it's the only possible drink that counts as two of your five. Um, that said, no, it doesn't, it doesn't shape our MPD thoughts because I, <coughs> I think that would be a case of the tail wagging the dog. We've got to make products that our consumers generally want that are delicious and convenient and fit the sort of, and sold sort of whatever, it, scratch whatever itch that they've got in terms of the need that they, that, that they need fulfilling. Um, so the veg pots, it wasn't ever a reason to do them. And actually, because you're going into everything else you're on shelf against doesn't have it on either. So the sort of, it's sort of, there's no comparative advantage there. Um, if I was starting again, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't call them a smoothie, I'd call them fruit in a bottle. And I wouldn't put 250 millilitres on the side of the bottle, I'd put 250 grams, and I would absolutely position it as it's fruit in a bottle, and then try and win the argument as fruit. It's because a fruit salad doesn't have VT on it. As soon as you put it in a blender, turn it to smoothies, it suddenly has it on it. So I know what I'd do the next time, but um, unfortunately it's not much used to us now. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for this. A lot of the things you said resonated with me because I've also started a company with two of my best friends. How oh, cool. Now, the question that I have is, uh, even though, for example, our company is doing quite well, we've been going for two years now, um, we run actually by now the world's largest scientific collaboration platform, but still you always see, I guess, as an entrepreneur, the things that still go wrong, that you want to improve, the daily mini crisis, the emotional roller coaster. Was there ever a point for you when you kind of felt now you've made it, or did the emotional roller coaster keep going for you, maybe until you did the trade sale exit? No, is the short answer. There's no, there's definitely no sense of having made it. Um, what I think there has been for me personally as a sort of a slow reduction in the mm -hmm. absolute fear and paranoia that it's all going to go horribly wrong. Um, it was about it took me about five years into the business before I would before I stopped walking in each morning and if you ever come through towers you sort of come up a, a, a little lane and then you turn around and there's a sort of, we're in a little industrial estate and mentally I was kind of always every day expecting to find a big pile of fermenting smoothies with a big sign saying we don't want these as if people sent us back and it was only when black cab drivers actually had heard of them which was like about year six and also when my mum said that we were now available in Morrison's in Huddersfield I thought okay so actually there might be something it, it, this might last but then in 2008 we nearly lost the business. We lost more money in that year than we made in the entire company's history. And that came after eight years of unbelievable growth. So you could say 2010, 2007, we'd made it. 100 million pound turnover, making you know good money. 2008, it absolutely was evaporating before our eyes. So I absolutely do not believe in the concept of having made it. I believe in keep going. <laughs> Paranoia is a really healthy thing. It's not supposed to feel good and easy. It's supposed to feel difficult and challenging, but exciting. And um, But I do think with time, one learns to be resilient to it and recognise the emotions and recognise the sort of the booms and the slumps and the, and, and the rhythms to it. And you sort of, you learn to ride it in a sort of slightly more steady way. So I sort of, I ping around less like on a ping pong Take, uh, like on a what's that thing called? Um, 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 the metal balls. Yeah, uh, pi not ping pong. Ping pong. Pinball, pinball. Pinball. I'm less like that emotionally these days. But um, yeah, I, I I think thinking you've made it is a is a scary thing to think. Yeah, paranoia is good. Yeah, well, it's good up to a point, Thank isn't you. it? I guess I I used to be too paranoid, and then you 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 the brain can only process one th can only be thinking one thing at a time. So if you're thinking negative paranoid thoughts, you're not thinking something positive and yeah. how you can make the business stronger. So I do try and marshal the focus to that rather than the fear, but... Yeah. As soon as you start thinking, am I, too, am I being too paranoid about being paranoid? That's a concern. <laughs> <That's laughs> and then I've got a phone number of someone you can ring. <laughs> um, people, you've talked about um, employing the right people and how important that is. Mm. But as sort of businesses grow up, and in effect we grow up as managers within business, you think, oh, I need, I need the growing up here, I need the suit, I need the production manager, I need the financier and you do employ the wrong people, you may like them and they may have some of the values, but they, they don't fit. Ha what, what would you do better next time? Because that's what, what have you learned from it? Well, I've learned, that I've learned that our biggest 
our two worst and most damaging hires were when we, there, w there was one person we brought in that absolutely didn't have the values, but they were very, very senior and really established and a great CV. So are they saying to you, this is what you need to be, you need to be more processy, more bureaucratic? They were telling you things that you thought, oh yes, we need to, we need to grow up and be that. No, we were just in a panic and we needed someone really senior in this bit of the business and they had a senior CV and so I just sort of was blind to the downside. I thought, if they've been doing that, level of job in that type of company, then they must be great. Okay. And I'm going to look gloss I'm not going to check that they're great. Yeah. And I'm going to gloss over the fact that I think that they're going to really, really upset people. And of course, what happened is they really upset people. And the great irony was they were absolutely fundamentally rubbish, rubbish at the job. Yeah. They just couldn't, they didn't know how to do their job. They'd just been promoted <coughs> to the yeah. point where they'd, they'd forgotten how to do it. Um, and then the second hire, great values fit, but just didn't have a single day's worth of experience. I mean, this is me. We have been the biggest idiots, you know, to, to bring in someone in a very senior role that had never done even remotely the job for one day just because they we bought into them from a values perspective was equally naive and dumb. I think you can take that risk with a junior person, but a senior person, they need to know what they're doing because they're leading a team of 30 people and they, it can get very messy very quickly. And so. how quickly did you turn it around, though? How quickly did you realise both things were wrong? How did you realise that people were wrong? Because often when we recruit the wrong person, we try and make them successful and we keep trying, we keep trying, because we're implicit. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm in a relative way proud of how I handled the first time, which I, you know, I, I had an honest adult chat with the person, explained why it wasn't working, <laughs> explained what it would need to be, gave them the opportunity to have another go. They didn't get there. We got them out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm deeply embarrassed about the second time, which is we just constantly remained optimistic, think that they're going to get there. Yeah. They're nearly there. They're, 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 oh, yeah. they will, they will, they will, they will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they didn't. Yeah. But that's definitely my fault, not their fault. It was, no. you know, they, they literally half killed themselves in the process of trying to get there. But a senior person can't do a job that they haven't got the experience of doing. So, so yeah. <laughs> basic things, but... It's really hard. I mean, it's... Yeah. It's hard but, uh, so I really believe you, I believe you absolutely need both at a senior level. If you only have skills and don't have the, the, the values, it'll go wrong. And if you only have vows and values and don't have the skills, it'll go wrong. You, I think both are mandatories. Yeah. One, we've got two, two last questions, if we can. So. Thank you very much for your um, uh, talk just now. But knowing what you know now, if you, how would you actually look to raise money from angels again? You know, what, what, do, what do you think you did wrong 10 years ago when you tried to raise money from angels, <coughs> knowing what you know now? It, would you do anything different, or was it just a product that people just would, it, you know, people just wouldn't get in terms of who the angels are, or was there something that you fundamentally did wrong? Do you think? Well, I think the people that said no were right to say no, because on paper, it's a dumb idea. Because our our model was we're going to set up a brand in food and drink. However, we're not going to own the manufacturing base, and we don't have any money to invest in developing the brand. And typically how it works is you're either a brand, you either own the manufacturing base and you're a big brand owner, or you're an own label supplier and you own the manufacturing base. And so you either got the money to spend in advertising or you've got the money to spend in factories. And, and we had neither. So we were going, well, it's not going to work, guys, is it? Because either the own label boys can rip you off and sell your same product for cheaper, can go to the same manufacturing partner that you're going to use. And the brand, the big brand owning businesses can come in and obliterate you with big marketing spends. And... I would kind of have that view now myself. It, we just happened to be the anomaly that saw the opportunity that the big brands couldn't get after and that the own label guys were happy for us to lead the market because well, as long as we were growing, we were growing fast and they didn't, they're, they're delighted. Um, so I don't blame the angels, I think. And also we were young and we didn't have any experience and we were trying to raise money before we developed the product, before we had a brand. So basic, we're going to them going, yeah, we've got this great idea for a smoothie company, but we don't have any smoothies, we don't know what it's called yet, and we don't know how to make them, and we haven't got any money. Would you give some money to some 326 year olds like that? I mean, I wouldn't. Um, so what would I do again differently? I think I would invest more time up front trying to get to a, actually a product and a brand so that people can actually see there is something there and get excited by it. Um, I guess the other thing is we just went from the world, we didn't have any network, we didn't have any contacts, we didn't know any rich people. 
I think it helps if you've got people that can open doors and just vouch for you. Because Morris, Morris's view was different to everyone else's. He said, well, it was the same when he said the business is rubbish. So, but I, I invest in people and I really believe in the three of you. I think there's something, I believe you guys are going to make a go, you'll make a success of something, but it won't be this. So actually what he insisted on was a setting of a business that we would be, it would be our business that he would get shares in. And irrespective of what that business did, so if we tried to really failed and then went on to something else, his sort of, he would own the, the share in whatever that next thing was. We should interview Maurice as well, I think, at one point. That'd be quite yeah, well, yeah, he's visionary. a great guy. He's he's a great guy. Back, put my money where he does. Yeah, I'm just going to follow you. on for that. I've just gone and launched a removable, degradable chewing gum in the US. And we're actually headed for the convenience stores because we think that's kind of like an easy way to go out after shelf space. And one of the issues which we're looking now is, is that what you've successfully done is you've gone after retail space. And I was wondering what your thought processes are because... The feedback we're getting is if you go after retail space, the big gorillas are going to come after you and actually put, you know, basically push you off either with their reps coming and actually taking your product off or actually offering so much that you're going to, to get out of it. And I'm just wondering how you actually overcame that problem of actually yeah. getting that key shelf space. Yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't at first. For the first 18 months, we were only sold in the independent trade. And so it was, you know, the one by one, you sign up one shop and then another, and the guy behind the counter is the guy that makes the decisions. And... I love having that as a bit of business. Actually, it's harder to get, but it's harder to lose because Tesco's can turn you off. That you know they can give you a thousand. Well, you know all this. So uh, again, I think some of the, un, inadvertently we got lucky with some stuff. There weren't there aren't many big brands that played in in the chiller. The chiller tends to be the preserve of so in chilled juice it tends with the exception of Tropicana that didn't make smoothies. It tended to be own label stuff. So there wasn't the big brand that could come along and and sort of muscle out of the way. They tried, we've, we've had 11 multinationals launch smoothie brands since we started and we've managed to fight them all off. But I can see how in chewing them, you're worried you've got all bit and tried and they can just sort of go like that. But um, I, I don't know, I've got this naive belief that if the product's better and the brand's better, the retailers quite like it. If, while you're small, you can be really useful to them because they, you, they can use you in the negotiation against the big guys, get more money out of you, and they've kind of got a vested interest to protect your little bit of space. And they're also they're just they're not allowed to do those things. And I know that they they often do, but you've only got to catch them at it twice and get Tesco's to know about it. That Tesco's can make it bloody. You can come down pretty he heavy on them. Mm -hmm. So if you're like a useful little strategic chip for them, then I think that helps too. Good. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. I really appreciate it. That. that was great. Yeah, thank you.